Hello everyone and welcome back to another Hearts of Iron 4 dev diary for Arms Against Tyranny. As we continue to move across the wonders of the Nordic nations, we today find ourselves with historical Norway. So without any delay, let's go straight in. Norway, Norway, Norway. To sum up the introduction for the dev diary, Norway's life seems to be on the uptick. 30 years ago they've gained independence and are beginning to grow what was a meagre industrial base into something much greater after the hard 30s. Unfortunately, for us who do know history, there might be a World War number 2 on the way to really put a spanner in the works. Continuing on from there, we find out that while things were looking better, the nature of Norway and its uptick seems to have lulled them into a maybe a sense of false security, in which they haven't actually prepared themselves for the eventuality of a second world war, and hopefully the starting national spirits and what seems to be a majority of the focus tree is about dealing with this unpreparedness. And here we see the four national spirits in question that you're going to be starting the game with, and we get to go through all of them to see just how screwed Norway's going to be. The first one is Complacent Cabinet, which is to represent the Norwegian government's unpreparedness for war, with basically huge blanketing debuffs towards preparing your country for any kind of conflict, getting your economy or trade laws in order, as well as changing your theorists, because you do start with a theorist called, I think, Ljungberg, or something to that degree, who was responsible for very poor mobilisation across the uh, Norwegian nation. So unfortunately, getting that manpower to be even slightly higher is going to be a difficult challenge with him in charge. TLDR, this spirit has to go. Next one down is Obsolete Armed Forces, and it kind of does what it says on the tin. The armed forces of Norway are nowhere near prepared for the kind of events of World War II, and you're going to be in charge of trying to get them up to uh, snuff. This is going to be extra unfortunate when you notice that it has debuffs to coastal forts, land forts specifically. Um, when you're going to be invaded by Germany, predominantly by naval invasion, having some good coastal forts might be pretty useful. Below that we have the Hard Thirties which is just an alternative name for dealing with the events of the Great Depression, and is going to be a pretty straightforward debuff, but my goodness what a debuff. 50% consumer goods factor gone. Literally just half the factories reduced to atoms. And the fourth and final national spirit you start with is anti-communist sentiment. Um, not anywhere near as damaging as everything else, it just gives you a slow uptick of fash inside your nation, to represent the fear that the nation had towards communism and the eventual, let's say, uh, coup perhaps that could occur in a more historical setting as the enemy from within builds up. With all the four national spirits covered, I think we can say that the starting conditions of Norway have been absolutely shafted. I mean, this is genuinely just an awful starting hand and it makes uh, any of the old things you could achieve with Norway I think quite literally impossible com in comparison. But as is with focus trees, you do get stronger as you go down them, so maybe there will be some redemption for Norway. Let's go take a look. Before us is the historical, quote unquote, political tree for Norway. As we can see, it's got a good sense of um, variety in terms of its moving around from side to side, um, and then it has a little centralised bit at the bottom. In terms of what we're going to see in it, it's hard to say, but uh, there is something on the right that we might want to keep a weather eye on. The beginning of the focus tree involves building up your civilian industry and trying to deal with what we can only assume to be those quite awful national spirits. We see leaving the hard 30s behind, which hopefully will reduce the fact that 50% of your um, civs are completely unusable, and also we see broken gun policies which maybe can help you towards gearing your army up for an actual conflict. We do get some further insight into the broken gun policies, which they do state will lock you out of most of the military focuses, so maybe something you want to consider just before you take it. But if you do take it, you'll get a great hefty lump of decisions. So seeing the decisions here for bracing the storm, it reminds me somewhat of the Spanish Civil War system where you were competing for states, but in this end, it's used for a different purpose. In the beginning, it seems like the developments you do in each individual state will be, let's say, industrial, civilian-based, trying to build up the nation, but in the event of conflict, the states that you have built up, you'll be able to flip them much better to be ready for conflict. 
So deciding, I guess, where your industry is going to be is also going to decide where your military defense and operations is also going to be for things like mills. As we see in this image, developing Helgeland, as it were, gives you some civilian factory construction speed up to 25%. So really good for building it up, but later on we'll unlock the defend Helgeland decisions. So yeah, I guess the idea is, is that they want you to build your industry in places that make more sense and therefore also have more reason to defend those places. The alternative being, of course, that you could just like maybe like abandon any of the industrial hubs and head into the really cold north and build all your industry up there and just hope nobody can ever, ever take you down. Further along, we see the decisions in question when you find yourself needing to convert all that build up into defense with the three tiers, um, defending, uh, emergency production, and then deploying the militias. Each of these will require not only political power, but also convoys. So make sure that you've got a few dockyards working on building convoys, because the marine you start with, uh, the merchant marines, are very large, but you will be spending them. In explanation to what the different levels were, for the defense level, we get a dynamic modifier. For level two, you get a free military factory. And at level three, you gain two militia divisions and a dynamic modifier, assuming that the state gets conquered. Considering though that some of the buffs might be um, statically um, consistent, like when you just get given a free military factory, I can imagine in those situations I'd be much more conscious of building them in places I think the Axis are not going to be able to invade, like the very tippity north of Norway. To show off some examples, we see here Defend Uplande. Goodness me, every time, every time I find a way to butcher how something is pronounced. As we can see, it removes the development, which we saw with the Civ Factory, etc., and instead gives you some division recovery rate, entrenchment speed, max entrenchment, and encircle penalty reduction, meaning, yeah, any buffs of building Civ Factories are long gone. The level 2 version of emergency production shows off the more developed state buffs that you got, so in this version we got local resources increased, um, as well as railway construction increased, but instead, when we get rid of it, we're going to get the local manpower continuing and a military factory. It also says there we keep the civilian factory construction speed, which is kind of interesting. I guess the emergency production can be kept for building more civ factories. And finally, should you find yourself at the level 3 with a fully highly developed state, you're going to be seeing things like local supplies going down, organisation going down, um, the ability to build military factories going down, but the ability to build air bases has been there, and naval dockyards too. As for what you get for when you switch over to the defense system, you get the add planted resistance, which gives you resistance decay speed minus 20, resistance growth speed plus 15, and resistance activity change plus 20%, as well as two units. So in the mindset of wanting to be able to quickly deploy an army should you need it, I guess this is pretty good. I guess it also it depends on what type of units you're going to be deploying, like how strong are they, are they actually worth the investment, versus what you have to put in to even get to a level 3 state. To my mind, it's always been the case that if you find yourself with troops on the shore, you've already kind of failed as Norway. Norway should really be hunkering down to the best of its ability and not losing a single tile. But hey, what do I know? Maybe the future meta of Norway involves reverse D-Daying Denmark or something. Literally, I couldn't tell you. Now at this point, I'd like to walk you through what is the remainder of the democratic um, focus tree, the historical democratic focus tree, but unfortunately the dev diary doesn't actually say too much. It makes very strong reference to the Fash invasion of Norway, which actually turns out to be the alternative Fash historical path, involving um, Kisling, I think his name is, Kisling's coup, as we see here. So unfortunately, being able to tell you what the nature of the actual tree we see here is, I'm not sure I can. We can make some guesses though, what have we got here? We've got um, Fortify Norway, so this is going to be about land forts, this is going to probably be about coastal forts, um, a mobile government, I guess some railroads to make sure things can move around quickly. As for down here though, unfortunately, yeah, um, I'm not really too sure. This could be kind of to do with like a government in exile mechanics, as well as um, trying to preparing the return to Norway. You see, it definitely sounds like a government in exile path, doesn't it? It does make me wonder though, 
why isn't there like a path for the acceptance that you're going to survive? <laughs> like at the top it says, weathering the storm to come. It doesn't sound like we're weathering the storm to come if we're, our whole plan is about becoming a government in exile. I don't know, just a thought. As I say, it's all just speculative because the dev diary unfortunately just doesn't tell us what any of these focuses do, so alas. With the speculation done, our next point is to talk about the historical Fash invasion of Norway. The key choice begins with this focus, which you can't actually take, it's one of those auto-completable focuses like, again, the Spanish Civil War. In this case, it's when you are attacked by a Fash nation. Interesting to note, this will also apply if you're going as like, let's say Sweden or Norway, uh, as Denmark, sorry, and you invade Norway. So just something you might want to consider for your Nordic invasion playthrough of Sweden. It could come to bite you. Moving forward, we find ourselves with Kisling's coup. Now this is different than the Fash invasion of Norway, because with the Fash invasion of Norway, any Fash nation can trigger that focus to be completed, which gives you like the um, minor buffs towards like political power and also the debuffs towards stability. Kisling's coup, however, is much more specific. So for those who don't know, in the event that Germany invades Norway, you might find yourselves with a Kisling, which by modern day terms would mean kind of a co-conspirator, toady, somebody who's working against the interests of your people. With Germany now invading you, you have a decision to make. How are you going to deal with the fash elements subverting your country? Your options as follows are Kisling's time has finally come, in which you give in and swap to Kisling's journey, creating a, a fash adjacent state. You've got the people of Norway will never forgive you traitor, which allows you to basically take the side of the democratic standard Norway that you were playing and most likely become a government in exile should your defenses not work out. And lastly, we've got we must do everything in our power to delay them, which is basically going to be just delaying the civil war, although I don't know if there's anything being said about permanently delaying it. Um, I guess the coup is inevitable. If you feel like taking the Kisling time, you've got yourself a whole new sub-branch to play with, beginning with Kisling's coup. So as we see here, Kisling's coup is but a seven day focus, which can only be completed if you're in an offensive war, well, Germany is in an offensive war, with you as Norway. It also says if the Fash power rejected our invitation to invade. If I was to think, that might be something to do with the uh, requires one of the following Nazjonal Samling, which to my memory was like one of the only fash political parties in Norway at the time run by Kisling. So maybe that's like the alt history path that we're not really getting to see. But regardless, the main takeaway from this is Kisling's coup is only available if Germany is invading Norway. So this isn't going to happen if you're playing Sweden and invading Norway as fash. Don't worry, uh, this shouldn't this shouldn't cause a civil war in Norway. Do note that once you take this focus, you get contested leadership, which uh, tanks uh, your recruitable population and stability. So let's hope you've got your nation in preparation for the civil war that's just begun. The next problem to deal with is kind of Kisling himself. Um, he's pretty bad, like, like really bad actually, and you might not really want him in power. As such, your immediate choice is going to be deciding whether you continue with his regime or get rid of him. If you choose to get rid of him, you're going down the path of a more German-aligned nation with uh, Josef uh, Treboven, and not too much stability and war support either, yikes. Or you can choose to keep Kisling and uh, maintain his regime, which has a similar effect of making the country worse. Oh god, look at, look at his stats. Kisling, he just loses stability and war support. There is no world where, <laughs> where going down this path is um, straight buffs. It's, uh, it's not an easy path to follow. The dev diary continues to expand the difference is that if you're choosing the Kisling path, you're going down a more independent path. So you're not working to become like a puppet of Germany, you're working towards your own interests, but you're massively shooting yourself in the foot. Unlike if you go down the Tobovan path, where you're going to align yourself much more with Germany to get the industry and such, but the actual things you can do as a nation is going to be very limited. Something interesting to note is that if you do go down the get rid of kissing path, much further down underneath the Norwegian Reichs Protectorate, 
you get the choice of changing your leader again to either become Kisling again, so bring back Kisling. Goodness me, he's like a he's like a tumor. The man won't leave. Or to go with a man called Jonas Lai, who was like extremely German adjacent, and might find yourself becoming an actual puppet of Germany. So as we see here, bringing back Kisling makes the already terrible Kisling even worse. Just awful, awful stats all around. On the flip side, we've got Jonas Lies Coup, which makes him a Germanophile officer, which is actually a not as terrible buff. Um, maybe a little bit too not terrible because um, that army experience gain is 0 0.25 daily. That's four, um, four days is one experience. I'd say that's almost one doctrine per year. Uh, that would be that would be pretty insane if that was the actual number, but I think I have it on good authority that that is a mistake and not the actual number. To expand upon why you might want to not choose going with the independent Kisling Norway, because being the toady I guess is cringe, they show you that he really is quite a terrible leader, and the fact that you can push him in, get rid of him, bring him back again, just makes him worse and worse. So here he is, kind of looking relatively smart. And then as the war progresses, he's um, his hair's getting a bit messy, he's not looking too happy. And then finally at the end, he kind of reminds me of um, as somebody from like a Romero horror film or something. Definitely he'd be like the, the killer, maybe with a hatchet who chases after you. The silver lining to the Kisling Cloud is you do get access to his reviving the Norgevildet focuses. Um, getting Vinland, getting Scotland, getting Ireland, Denmark, Sweden, and then Bjarmaland. Bjarmaland, I guess, to my mind, would be something to do with, like, maybe... It's either parts of Finland, or it's, like, Mamansk in Russia and uh, that region. Regardless, it seems like the end result of Kisling, regardless of just how terrible he is, is you get to build up your great Viking Nordic Empire. So, we're coming closer towards the end of the Dev Diary now, because that's the majority of the political stuff focused covered. Um, in total, I'll say, it's <laughs> well, on one side, we actually weren't told much about the democratic path and those later focuses, so I really don't know how it feels to play, whether it's like government in exile focused entirely or not. But in terms of the Fash path, I'm not sure if I like it. I feel like the two options you have are shooting yourself in the foot to become a Kisling, or making yourself so German aligned that you're basically living in the shadow, which is also shooting yourself in the foot. So I'm not sure between government in exile, puppet, or really terrible leader, which is the most fun to play. But I guess Kisling restoring some kind of Viking age reminiscent empire has some charm to it. Next up, we're going to be looking at the traditional sounding uh, industrial branch, Navy branch, Army branch, and Air Force branch. Keeping in line with what I felt about uh, Sweden and Finland, I've noticed that they've kind of done a return to form in many ways regarding how focus trees look. So the army tree is, you know, it's pretty much your old fashioned army tree. Here we've got building an independent Norway, which is going to be your industrial tree, including the, I assume the two research slots on top of each other. The Air Force branch looking pretty nice. Um, I guess this is your traditional designer um, buying versus making domestic planes choice that people like to make. And at the end we see the navy branch with nice expanding the dockyards and the eventual choice between building up a large navy with battleships and carriers versus building a more tactical navy with submarines and destroyers, as well as a slight thing on the side to do with the merchant ships considering Norway had such a great merchant ship navy. In short, this is all very, as one might expect, um, sticking in line with the Swedish focus tree, I feel it's generic. That is the word I feel about it. There's nothing in here that looks too crazy. I'm kind of disappointed, but maybe this is in a future thing. There's nothing to do with um, a certain island on the north coast, but I think we'll get into that later. It's at this point that they reiterate that if you're going down the historical democratic path, taking the broken gun national spirit will lock you out of the majority of these focuses apart from the industrial tree. In terms of what we see of the tree, there's not too much that I can show off, but some of the focuses are quite as you might expect. 
The coastal fort focus, I mean, whoever did the art has done an excellent job here, um, but the actual focus what it gives you is relatively weak. Free coastal forts. Just, just, you know, just, just free. As for the tank branch, we see the focus Reich's Tanken, I guess, which, as far as I can detect, is somebody's um, pride of place. In the Dev Diaries description, we find out that there was an idea for Norway to begin mobilizing tanks, but they kind of figured out they were far too expensive and uh, a lot of like um, dedication was required to actually get them up to snuff. So they ended up buying one tank from Sweden. They didn't buy everything for it, like the armor and the guns, and it kind of looked terrible, as you see in the image there. As such, the focus aims to kind of emulate this discovery by the Norwegians being allowed to get themselves a tank from either Sweden, the Soviet Union or Germany and have a similar outcome. As we see here, they welcome their new national tank, which gives them the technology of the tank, which is good, um, as well as a single unit of a Swedish light tank chassis. And that's it. That's all you get. So I feel like you take this focus really to be the stepping stone to building up tanks if you really want to, but other than that, it's kind of a flavorful thing. Honestly though, with the amount of snow and hardship and forests, oh goodness me, the forests inside of um, the north, I think there's also quite a few hills and mountains in Norway actually. I'm not sure how much you'd want tanks. I think I'd, uh, I think I'll take some mountaineers instead. And with that, we reach the end of the Focus Street Dev Diary. Um, yeah, what a strange Dev Diary. It's not often that you get to see the Focus Tree in its entirety, but you don't actually get to see what so many of the focuses do. I do wonder respectfully if it's because quite a lot of the focuses aren't actually done yet. Like they've, they've designed them, but they haven't actually coded them in. So there's not too much to show off there. And maybe later on, you'll see more. But as of right now, we only got a look as to what the framing would look like. But don't worry, to wrap this dev diary up, we have some good news. So we get a nice look at what Norway looks like. And as we can see here, it has 11 states. Um, I did predict, well, it was kind of obvious that they would start breaking down Norway into smaller states. So we've got Oslo Fjord there and um, Agde. I feel that's quite new. So one can imagine that with all these new states, there should be, if nothing else, a good base for building a larger industry than perhaps what was previously possible. So the rate of expansion in the Nordic should be greater. And in another mindset, if you're going for like a unifying the Nordics, a Sweden kind of thing, I feel like the potential for snowballing growth after you annex Norway, which remember is super duper weak with all those terrible national spirits, is going to be pretty good. And to wrap things up, we have a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful cherry on the cake in the form of Jan Mayen being the very small, wholesome island right at the top of the map that is now an independent state for Norway with 10 people living on it. Um, what a useless state, but I have a dream. I have a great dream that maybe, just maybe, Paradox will create a small branch, three or four focuses to build, let's say, like a, a government in exile base on the island, if you know what I mean. Like the ships can pot dock there or something, and some people are like evacuating there just to really avoid the consequence of the German occupation. The alternative is this is going to be an excuse for um, Wojtek, the bear who runs Poland, to have a uh, adversary in the form of a polar bear that runs Norway. Hey, I'm just I'm just sticking it out there. It's not impossible, is it? It's not impossible. So with that, the dream of a polar bear ruling Norway and a mystery focus tree, which we know what it looks like, we just don't know what the focuses do. I'll say that I think that the Norwegian focus tree has prospect, but a little bit too generic. And as for the fast tree, I do feel like I'm shooting myself in the foot by playing it. But maybe the alternative uh, versions of it, such as the alt history paths, will rectify that and make it feel a lot better. The democratic path? Alas, I simply don't know what the focuses do. With that, I'll say thank you very much for watching. Hopefully we'll have more information next time. 
um, presumably on Denmark, but you never know, you might get a cheeky Iceland focus tree. If you liked, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you all uh, next time. There's going to be a polar bear in Norway, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Bye.